This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact. Well, it's not a Panthers game here at the stadium or a NASCAR race at the Speedway, but it sure feels like one. I'm Jeff Sonier. Stick around as thousands show up to get their shots at one of the Charlotte area's COVID vaccine super sites. Plus, we'll introduce you to a Charlotte business thriving after moving from New York, and we'll take you inside a podcast studio to teach you how it's done with a former NFL player. Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. One million COVID shots from frozen January to the 4th of July. That's the goal of two Charlotte area vaccine super sites at Bank of America Stadium and Charlotte Motor Speedway. Thousands signing up and lining up on weekends, not for game day or race day, but for vaccine days everybody getting the shots they need to prevent getting the virus that nobody wants. PBS Charlotte's Jeff Sonier shows us what it's like inside and outside on vaccine weekend. Well, first thing to remember, if you are coming here to the stadium or the speedway for your COVID shot, is to make sure you make a patient appointment first. And then, just like on game day or on race day, on vaccine days, if you are one of the patients here, well, that's also what you'll have to bring, you know, some patients. Like a lot of things worth waiting for, this vaccine weekend at Bank of America Stadium starts with a line. In this case, a long line. Hey there, do you have an appointment today? Yeah. Walk in or drive through? Drive through. Drive through, you're gonna be in the right hand lane, okay, behind that truck, straight ahead. Okay, y'all have a good one. On one side of the stadium, this line is for the patients getting their vaccinations without getting out of their cars. You know, a needle in your Volkswagen Beetle a shot in your Fiat, maybe even a vaccine in your limousine. Everybody rolling down their windows and rolling up their sleeves. Hospital workers checking each patient ID, each patient getting a mark on their windshield, then a packet of information, and then finally the vaccination. After another line or lane into one of these tents where the shots are given and we got the right partners who know how to set up mass events, move people safely through these events, um, and, and do it with speed. And so Dr. Dave really Calloway is right Chief of right Disaster right Medicine at Atrium Health, which is scheduling the appointments and providing the medical staff at the stadium. They're also providing the vaccine itself. On this weekend, 9,000 doses a day. We're working through uh, the drive-in and the walk-in uh, processes where we split and it went smoothly. We were able to keep social distancing. We were able to move people quickly through the lines, get them their shots. Thanks for your patience. Step into the white tent and have some fun. <laughs> have a good time, folks. Here on the walk-in side of the stadium, it feels like a Panther game day. No tailgaters, but a steady stream of fans, or patients, here on Stonewall Street. How often do you come down to the stadium? Never. Still, on this gray Saturday, Marilyn Boyle says, yeah, it's worth it, even after getting stuck in the uptown vaccine traffic jam. The traffic was terrible. <laughs> you know, everybody's trying to cut ahead of everybody, but I left an hour before I was supposed to, and I'm still late. But you're here. I'm here. <laughs> Here, for the COVID shot, she would have waited three months for otherwise. Hey, and yeah. I don't really care. I'm not in a hurry. You just want to get your shot. I just want to get my shot. Hi, any signs or symptoms of COVID? No, no. COVID. Outside the stadium, the first temperature test comes at the front of that long white tent entrance. After that, the line turns into a zigzag, and then another temp test just before heading inside. <laughs> Any signs or symptoms of COVID? No. That's where we catch up with Terry Payne, who moved to Charlotte from Durham to be closer to her extended family. And then came COVID. Uh, we're in a pandemic. We can't, we can't go anywhere, do anything. I have grandkids. I have to quarantine before I can come see them. That's why she's at the stadium today, filling out cards, answering questions. Is this your first COVID vaccine? Okay. Do you have any food allergies? Do you have any medication allergies? 
Terry waiting patiently in line with other patients just outside the stadium vaccination area before finally getting what she came for, a little rubbing alcohol from the nurse and then a shot in the arm to prevent coronavirus that Terry thinks might just give our predictable pandemic lives a shot in the arm too. So I think we're good to take the vaccine and get back to normalcy, get back to work, to school, you know, to travel, to fun, <laughs> to hugging. And looking at the excitement of the community that's actually coming in, it's very, um, it's heartwarming. It's, you know, we've gone from fear to hope by being able to provide vaccines. I hate needles. Yeah. <laughs> Michael Brown and his wife are heading home after their COVID vaccines. And he says, except for that needle, this whole Max Vax thing at the stadium worked out pretty well for them. Were you surprised you could get in, get an appointment, get out so quickly today? Um, it took a little while to get the appointment. Mm -hmm. You know, about two days on the phone trying to get through. Mm -hmm. But yeah, getting in and getting out was okay. How long of a line was it? Oh my God, <laughs> probably a mile in mazes. <laughs> and since this is just their first of two vaccine doses, the Browns say they're ready to do it all again. The traffic, the crowds, the lines, yeah, even the needle. I'll feel better after I take the second one. <laughs> a month from now, right? Yes. In fact, everybody who gets a vaccine appointment here at the stadium and the Speedway also gets an automatic return trip one month later for dose number two. And while you don't have to get your COVID shot here, well, if you don't have a car, there are bus routes and a light rail line right nearby to make getting to the stadium maybe a little bit easier. Also, the folks who got their vaccinations here say that the uh, appointments are a little bit easier to get and a little bit sooner to get, which I guess is the whole idea to vaccinate as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, and as safely as possible. Amy? Thanks so much, Jeff. To find out more about the next big vaccine weekend, check out our website at pbscharlotte.org. You'll find a link to an Atrium Health webpage with details about all upcoming vaccine super site events. Well, for years now, the Carolinas have been a hot spot for relocating families. I was one of them back in 2013. Since 2015, North Carolina has averaged more than 110,000 new residents annually, with South Carolina adding more than 60,000 each year. It's no wonder both states consistently rank in the top 10 for population growth. But it's not just people moving here. Lured by cheaper land and better taxes, companies from up north are also migrating south. Carolina Impact's Jason Terzas introduces us to one of those in tonight's business profile. The 2 1 pitch. It's a family owned business born out of the 1969 World Series. The Mets are the world champion. That's now in its second generation. My father was nice enough to give the business to us. Employing some 250 people in Fort Mill. Instantly saw that this place was our home. And over the course of 50 plus years, has grown into one of America's largest printing companies. 50 years is, is, is remarkable, you just don't see that. Churning out more than a million pieces of mail a day. We produce about 400 million outbound packages a year, so we'll go through about 700 million envelopes a year. The P in PCI Group doesn't stand for printing, as you might suspect. Instead, Players Computer Inc. Those players, Bud Harrelson and Jerry Grody, used a portion of their 1969 World Series championship money to invest in a startup computer company. Chris Kropak Sr., an engineer by trade, was Harrelson's neighbor at the time on Long Island. And said, hey, can you help me out? You understand about this computer stuff. I don't, I'm a baseball player. Can you help me out and run the business? PCI started as an outsourcing company, doing large scale data entry work, utilizing its celebrity investors to generate business. Did a lot of payroll for the city of New York, we key parking tickets for the city of New York. As a young kid, it was only natural for Chris Kropak Jr. to hang out with his dad at the office. You know, my dad always worked, went there over the weekend. So when you're hanging out with dad on Saturday and Sunday, you have no choice, you go to the office and that's your play area, right? Chris Jr. went off to college with absolutely no intention of going to work for his father. Never wanted to be in the business, never wanted to be in the computer business. I actually wanted to be in the food business somehow, some way. But after six years working in a deli, Chris was ready for a change. I said to my dad, I said, hey, I, I don't think I could do this the rest of my life. I said, I want to do something that maybe I'll come work for you. And my interview was, well, you never said 
you wanted to work for me. You said, actually, you never wanted to work for me. I go, yeah, I don't, but I don't know what else to do. So why don't I try it out there? And if it doesn't work, then I'll go someplace else. With brother-in-law Skip also on board, PCI steadily grew, transitioning from data entry into more direct mail, sending out letters on behalf of collection agencies, one of which had people manually putting bills into envelopes. I go, they manually insert. I go, you know, I have a machine that could do that. And she goes, you have a machine that could do that? I go, I have a machine that could do that. After 33 years, Chris Sr. retired, leaving the company to Skip and Chris Jr. We took over in 2003 okay. when his dad retired. Okay. So we're 50 50 partners. PCI enjoyed sustained growth, but the cost of doing business on Long Island was getting to be too much in the form of high taxes, utilities, and wages. I did a big study on moving from New York, 100,000 square facility in New York, 100,000 square facility down in the south, and it said I can save a lot of money, almost a million dollars a year going down south. I said, it's a no-brainer, we got to do it. After ruling out Atlanta and Knoxville, they settled on Charlotte. Lancaster County, which I'm located in right now, gave me a great incentive package. They gave me a six and a half million dollars of you know, tax deferment over 10 years, which was great. It was going to pay for the move, more than pay for the move, did everything. I can't believe that this is almost too good to be true, the Charlotte area. Moving 22 employees and all that equipment, PCI settled into a 93,000 square foot facility sitting on 34 acres in 2008. And after surviving the financial crisis, saw its business triple in size with the acquisition of a major healthcare client. In June of 2014, we had 80 employees. Um, by October 2014, we had 240. 2017 saw another expansion with the opening of a second production facility in Dallas, giving PCI quicker access to the western half of the United States. So Chris and I, you know, we're responsible now for 300 roughly people. That's 300 families that we feed and support. So it's a big responsibility. You hear the pop, 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 pop. That's the folding going on right now. The constant hum of the production line, huge million dollar machines rolling off paper, feeding into gigantic printers, envelopes churned out and sealed. Each one of these machines produces about 22,000 number 10 envelopes an hour. Everything then shrink wrapped and sent off to the post office, all while maintaining accuracy and most of all security. From outside gates to key card access, cameras just about everywhere, and a network operating center keeping track of worldwide cyber threats. We're constantly investing money. I've just spent $3 million over the last three years to, in, to um, upgrade our IT infrastructure. Everything that we produce here and, and print here, we, we treat with the highest level of integrity and, and, um, and care because you're dealing with uh, people's personal information. We print a lot of checks for our clients. We print anywhere between six to eight million checks a month for our clients. Over five decades in business. Did my father ever think we'd get to 50 years? No. With unimagined growth. In 2003, we were roughly doing $3 million in business. We just eclipsed $57 million in 2019. It's no wonder you'll see symbols of American patriotism all over PCI's corporate offices. We don't know anything other than this company. It's earth shattering where we, where we came from, where we are now, very, very lucky. You might say these guys are living proof of the American dream. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Terzis reporting. Thanks, Jason. We're happy to report that Chris Kropak Sr. is now 87 years old and doing very well. He left Long Island for South Carolina to be closer to his family and grandchildren. Well, these days, you can pretty much buy anything you want at an online store, but there was a time not that long ago when you couldn't, and things had to be made by hand. Jason Terzes and producer John Branscombe introduce us to two ladies keeping the tradition of quilting alive. On a chilly night, many find comfort snuggling under a warm quilt. These handcrafted treasures are often passed down through the generations. But before you can hand down or even get comfy under that quilt, someone has to know how to make it. Someone like longtime quilter Jane Godshell. When you make a quilt, you put three fabrics together. You have your top layer, your batting, and then the backing. And then you sew through all three layers, and that makes a quilt. The technique of quilting dates back thousands of years, but just a couple hundred years ago, as American pioneering families moved west and further away from the nearest general store, quilting proved to be an essential skill. The 1800s definitely because you had a much greater movement in the country and they needed the warmth as they went. So yeah, again, it became a necessity that they had to have bed coverings. Those early pioneering women were resourceful and little went to waste. 
the pioneer women would do them by, you know, candlelight um, and put every bit of scrap that they could find from old clothing or whatever into it. In the early 20th century, the resourceful spirit continued as a new source of cloth came into vogue. Farmers and companies got onto this real quick that women needed fabric. So feed sacks came into being where they would actually be printed. They'd have, they'd come in, you know, whether it was, you know, your hog feed or your, you know, your corn or flour or whatever, it would come in, in a fabric. So women would use that. When it comes to quilts, there's a wide range of style and purpose. There's handwork, there's machine work, there's modern quilts, there's traditional quilts, there's just all kinds. Quilts could be political. Um, that was a big thing that started in this country during the times of um, women's suffrage. There were a lot of quilts made about that. But eventually the need to make quilts diminished with modern manufacturing. Then another shift, a societal shift. Women were going back to work in the sort of in the 50s, but definitely in the 60s and 70s. There were more careers happening out there, and then women who had careers and had families to take care of. So the time was just not there. Jane says it was around the American Bicentennial in 1976 when quilting went from essential skill to more of a hobby and craft. People got interested again, and that's when, as far as documentation goes, it became more of an industry. These days, Jane is a member of two local quilting guilds and shares her years of knowledge at various quilt shows. Her longtime friend and fellow guild member, Teresa Justice, was first exposed to quilting by her mother, but it wasn't until the 1990s when she got serious about the craft. I like to think of myself as a traditional quilter. Teresa put her skills to use after discovering a forgotten family heirloom. Okay, that is a, um, what they call a postage stamp quilt. It's made up of one inch blocks. And my husband's Aunt Gertrude actually made that all by hand. But Teresa says Aunt Gertrude left this one with a bit of work. She gave it to my mother-in-law who put it in a closet for many years and I discovered it one day at her house and I asked her if I could take it home and finish it for her. And finish it she did. Today, this quilt made up of tiny squares is a cherished multi-generational heirloom. Quilters like Teresa and Jane say it's hard for them to not quilt. I seriously can't just sit and watch a movie. I need to be knitting or sewing or doing something because um, I feel like I'm wasting time otherwise, and this is something I love to do. But it's not just about the history of the craft or the quilts themselves. There's more going on here. Other quilters are my closest friends, and you get close, it's like sisters. For Caroline Impact, I'm Jason Terzis reporting. It's nice to see the quilting tradition remain strong for future generations to love and learn. Well, have you caught the podcast craze? 50% of U.S. homes listen to podcasts. 16 million Americans call themselves avid podcast fans. Did you ever wonder how they're made? Carolina Impact's Sheila Saints takes us into the studio to find out. I mean, 230 pounds, 4% body fat, no, dog. I don't remember you. That's former NFL player Steve Smith Sr. behind the microphone. A little bit, a lot of bit about your story also, too, but... In his podcast, Cut To It, Smith and co-host Gerard Littlejohn interview athletes and entertainers, getting to know the private person behind the public persona. Well, you know, on the podcast, we really just, uh, I try to ask questions and talk to the, to the guests about who they are as a human being, um, as a parent, as a father, as a mother. Um, as a businesswoman, businessman, just all encompassing, um, a real holistic look at the, at the athlete, at the individual. Smith's podcast is a client of the Queen City Podcast Network, a group of about 30 local contributors producing fresh content every week. Steve, what made you decide to start a podcast? It's a lot of work. Yes, it is, and I have a great team. I have a lot of people around me that are assisting me. And really the question is, what do we want to be? And we want to be a podcast that really emphasizes the individuals in New Jersey, um, male and female. A podcast is a series of digital audio files you can download from the Internet. And the Queen City Podcast Network is the first of its kind in the country to operate as a business. Commercial radio in particular has kind of turned its back on local, and we're kind of embracing that. And I think, you know, we're providing a service, whether it's, you know, news and current events or comedy or food or whatever it is that 
people in a local environment need to hear. National radio personality and podcaster Sherry Lynch hosts and distributes three podcasts from a home studio in Charlotte through her own company, Now Media. One of the perks of working from home. In the content space, in the content creator space, um, women are doing incredible work. Lynch started podcasting in 2006. Back in 2006, podcasts were called RSS feeds, if anybody had a name for them at all, and it was super fringy. And um, it was so fringy that this was before Apple began digitally encoding those podcasts to put them into iTunes. I mean, it was just the frontier, it was the Wild West. Podcasting is just the newest version of the ancient human impulse, tell me a story. That's all podcasting is. It's, t it's this, this moment's response to tell me a story. So it's very democratic. The barrier to entry to have a podcast is very, very low. In 2020, Charlotte virtually hosted its first podcast festival. 14,000 people registered. So what makes podcasting such a thing in Charlotte? Charlotte is is um, is very tech savvy, I think. I think that's got a lot to do with it. I think there are a lot of people here who have something to say and who want to be heard. And here in Charlotte, there's been a very distinct effort to kind of bring podcasters together. You may be thinking, I want to start my own podcast, but what does it take? It turns out it takes a good idea and a good microphone. Well, here's the great news for um, people that would like to get into podcasting. The gear that you need to produce a really high quality product is very, very cheap. Again, super democratic. You can get a relatively inexpensive microphone, um, a USB microphone that just plugs into your laptop and like literally maybe $50 later, you're ready to go. You need a story to tell. You need to know who you're telling it to and why you're telling it. And if you have all of that, you're on your way to being a podcaster. It's easy to find podcasts on a smartphone or computer. Open up that app, uh, search for a topic you like, if it's sports or rock climbing or music or whatever it is, um, and just start exploring. There's 1.2 million podcasts for you, just, just waiting to, <laughs> for you to find them. Like I promise there's something out there you'll want to listen to. There's so many wonderful stories and deep, meaningful um, connections to be made in this medium. How can you not love podcasting? I mean, I just, how can you not love it? If you don't love it, I challenge you, you haven't found the right one. It's a surprise every time. <laughs> we have such a great conversation that I get a different, they get a different perspective of me, I get a different perspective of them. In a twine, I'm talking about so give a listen, or maybe pick up the microphone. You might leave inspired, educated, or entertained. For Carolina Impact, I'm Sheila Saints reporting. Thank you, Sheila. I'm close to starting my own podcast these days to go along with the next book that I'm writing called The Dirty F Word, Lessons We Learn From Our Failures. Check out my YouTube channel to see how my guests share details that can help us all. Well, that's all we have time for this evening. Thanks so much for your time. We always appreciate it. And we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. of PBS Charlotte.